Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Reformers Unanimous Facebook Live. Um, we're having a little bit of difficulty getting started tonight, so I hope that those of you who's tuned in, looking for us, trying to get us, uh, so uh, now you've got us, I hope. Um, principle number two I'm going to talk to you about real fast. Principle number two says that every sin has its origin in our heart. Okay? <clears throat> the other week I quoted Psalm 1. We're going to quote all six verses this time. Um, I made the mistake of not quoting them all. So let's go ahead, any students there and any here, let's quote Psalm 1. Ready? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So are you students, we say that every Friday night. If you don't know that, if you're new to RU, that's what we do. We quote Psalm 1, we have a good time, I mess up, the students mess up. Uh, Y'all keep me straight. Because um, I will mess up any time, and that's what's the that's the fun of it. Psalm one is deep in my heart. Um, it has a, a lot of root because of the amount of times I've quoted it, but the amount of times that God has helped me with a thing called meditating on it. So I want to walk you through that because principle number one, talking about every sin has its origin in our heart. Steve Currington, one of the main things he talks about is our heart. It's a it's our meditator. And what is wrong with us when we're not being able to do right, when we're in this sinful behavior in life, we have a broken meditator, all right? A lot of the world does not recognize spiritual things, um, and, and, and what I'm really meaning is somebody who's agnostic or atheist. Now, there's different levels there of extreme, but atheists, don't, they don't believe in any spiritual aspects of anything, soul, spirit, heart, nothing. Um, but the funny thing is, is everybody knows what a broken heart is. Everybody's had a broken heart before. Sometime in their life, you've had your heart broken. But um, what I'm talking about is, spiritually speaking, every person, when we're born, we're born with a dead spirit. This is a spirit that needs to be quickened by God when he moves into your heart. The Holy Spirit moves in through salvation. God saves your soul. He moves in and he gives you a new heart, a heart of flesh. All right, so as a Christian, you have this new heart, but what we do, because we don't have discipleship, we're not taught the Bible, we're not taught how to walk and how to act and, and how to really relate with God, we end up with a broken meditator. That's meaning that we really end up yielding to the flesh, the things of the world, and thinking and doing more things for the world than we do for God. And in RU, what we do is we correct that brokenness. We show you and teach you, and God teaches us, how to get that right, how to meditate on him. And the reason I'm quoting Psalm 1 is to kind of go through the principles a little bit, but also share Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So let me go right here to Jeremiah real fast and just share something that might seem familiar to you. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope is in the Lord, uh, and, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when uh, heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And then verse 9 it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? And one more scripture real fast, and then I'll be done with scripture. Verse 11, chapter 15 of Matthew. So if you've got to take notes or write an essay, you may want to try to catch this scripture and go to it uh, because you're going to need to. You may forget. All right, verse 11, chapter 15, it says, just, this is Jesus. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. I'm going to skip to verse 17. In this situation, what's going on right here, Jesus is answering uh, questions and teaching his disciples. He says, Do not ye understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. 
For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So I'm going to wrap that up for you, and I just gave you this scripture and these points because maybe it'll give you some material to kind of meditate on or to write your essay or to do whatever it is you need to do. Meditate on it, pray about it, uh, study it. But what all that means, in RU we deal with a lot of times, what is sin? What's wrong? What's, what's, what is this thing called sin? And we are under the assumption that the things that we're doing, drinking, or, or even smoking is the sin. But the sin, it comes out of our heart. When we say bad things, when we get mad at somebody, that's the most convicting thing as a Christian is the fact that really whenever I do wrong, it's because of my broken heart, my meditator. It's been, it, it really tells you where you've been putting your time that week, where you've been putting your thoughts. Have you been reading the Bible? And so when I, out of the well of my heart, these things come up, it really reveals what's going on in my heart. So Christians and non-Christians, our heart is our meditator, and the best thing for a person to do is meditate on the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So real quick, that was really fast. Um, we've got three testimonies to share with you. Who wants to go first? All right, Roscoe. Roscoe this is Roscoe Livingston. He's an assistant men's group leader, and um, he's going to share a little few words with us, and uh, or however long he's got, or what he's got on his heart. He's going to share with you. So come on, Roscoe. <laughs> You know, yeah, I've been thinking all week on what I want to talk about, you know. Um, it, it hit me today, it hit me the other day that I wanted to talk about my belief in God. And, um, I, and that's what you opened up with was, you know, you're talking about non believers, atheists, and all this. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. And, um, my Bible that I got right here, it was given to me back in. August 20th, 2009, by uh, Ken Meeks at Counseling Services. That was the first and last time I seen this Bible. And this, my sister found it out in the barn about six, seven months ago. And this, this Bible came back to me. I didn't, I didn't look for it, it came back to me. Amen, that's right. But <clears throat> that's what I want to talk about. About my belief in God. You know, for, the, for the past 25 or 30 years, I've been a self proclaimed atheist. You couldn't tell me there was a God. I didn't want to hear about no God. There was no magic man in the sky. <clears throat> Beyond the clouds, we couldn't see or hear, but it would grant us wishes, or what <clears throat> y'all call blessings. I didn't want to hear it. <clears throat> you don't try to talk to me about it, point blank, period. Just, I didn't. Wasn't even in my vocabulary. But my life changed. All that changed December 27, 2016, when I had my car wrecked and my kids in the car. My eyes was open and God came into my life. It wasn't that night, but several days later when I went for my bond here. Now, now keep in mind, I, I worked for a bondsman at the time. I worked for a bail bond. So my, my bond was signed. I got my bond three days later. I remember thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll be out of here before the ink on the bond paper is dry. I'm going to go. <clears throat> but <clears throat> sitting in the holding cell waiting to go back to the jail, something came over me. I started thinking about God, which is something I never did. And <clears throat> I remember saying, I remember <clears throat> saying, uh, you know, I remember the prayer. I said, God, if you're real, if you do exist, give me a sign. Guide me. Got my heart. What is my next move? Come on, magic man. <laughs> Come on, magic man. Give me what you got. You know, and I just and <clears throat> I was just sitting there thinking, and finally, time to come to go back to jail. I had to uh, call the girl I was dating at the time and tell her, "Come on and get me." I, I had a bond, but I don't. I don't remember the ride back to jail. I do remember it was one of the most graceful, peaceful. Rides I've ever been on. My mind was at peace. Everything about me was at peace. I was, 
So when I got back to jail, I didn't even go to the phone. I went to my room and I talked to God some more. And <clears throat> finally go over to, for the call and make that call. She says, oh my God, you got a bond. And uh, she said, I'm going to talk to Jack. I'm going to talk to your mom. He said, you'll sign your bond if your mom will stand good for it. In other words, it wasn't going to cost me a penny to get out of jail. I was, I was going. Um, I could hear her take a deep breath to speak. <clears throat> and I, I spoke. I went to speak to tell her to come get me, but that wasn't the words that come out of my mouth. My words were don't. Don't you dare let him, her, or anybody else sign my bond. I'm not coming home. I didn't want to go home. But I was at peace. And that was, that was the first time I really believed in love since I was a kid. And, um, and you know, to make a long story short, I was looking at three years minimum in prison. They wasn't coming down. They was going to go up from three years up. They wasn't coming down. But um, I just kept praying and I started seeing the blessings falling into place. Just like I prayed for. It wasn't overnight. When I sat in jail for three months before I was sentenced, when I was sentenced, I ended up in 12 months of drug court, eight months in jail, served four. I was already in there three months. I just had a month to go. You know, because it has for a bigger blessing than that. Right. You know, I mean, God has plans for every single one of us. Yep. Not everybody. God, right, God gives his blessings. He will bless you. And you just put God in your heart, put God first. And watch what he can and will do for you. He sure made me into a believer. Amen. That's right. So I mean, when I come, when I come to argue, I don't, I don't speak much because I like to sit and listen. Because my praise is God opens my eyes every day, see every day. Amen. That's right. That's that's my praise. I just like to, I like to sit around and listen and watch what other people, the praise and the, the blessings they get. You know, and I came, I came to argue through drug court like a, like a lot of people did to get my papers signed. But I found a home. It's, this is my home. And it, it hurts me that it can't be here every Friday night. And I watch it live, but it's, it's not the same. It's not the same as being here with y'all guys. Right. Maybe everything will get back to normal. sure how long, how long, David? It's been a good little while now, so uh, two years, over two years? It's over a year, it's, not quite two long. Okay, so anyhow, a year or two years, uh, David has came along, him and his wife Mackenzie and his daughter Josie and Kenley, such a blessing, uh, just, and such a blessing to our church family too, just talking about good people. Uh, I'm appreciative of Roscoe, and if it seemed like I was in a hurry, and you always realize why afterwards, because God wanted to get me out of the way, so I'm going to continue to get out of the way. I hope everybody's uh, well tonight. I'm glad to be here, and I'm a lot like Roscoe. I, it doesn't feel right not being here on Friday night. We've been doing this for, uh, personally, uh, a little over two years now. It just doesn't feel right not being here with, with a group of men on Friday night. And there's nothing else that I would rather do on Friday night now than to be here at RU and praising the Lord. And uh, this week, actually I've known about this for about three weeks, that I was going to be here tonight to praise the Lord. And I thought, boy, I'm going to write something down. I'm going to, I'm going to 
do something. <clears throat> but my praise, and it's going to sound generic, but my praise is this program. My praise is what God has done in my life. I've been a Christian. I've known God for 12 years. I came to know him in the summer of 2008 or early fall 2008. But as I was thinking today, God's known me for 35 years. And I've known him for, for 12, trying to be a Christian or, or do whatever. Um, but it didn't take long for the world to follow, to swallow me back up. Uh, after I became saved, I wasn't discipled. I wasn't uh, doing the things that I should have done. I was a Sunday morning Christian. I'd get my Bible out on Sunday morning and I would put it up on Sunday to go eat. But uh, I've been in LaGrange, Georgia now uh, just about three years. And not long after we moved here, we came to this church and we found this church. And not long after joining the church, we found this program. And my wife came because of what her testimony is. And she came back home that Friday night. She said, you've got to go and see what this program is about. Yes, I can't explain it, but you need to go. Yes. So the next Friday night, we were there, had my girls here. Didn't know what the world, uh, what the Lord was trying to tell me, but I knew he was speaking to me. And this program has discipled me. And I'm not just a Christian now, and I know that Jesus died on the cross. I have a personal relationship with the Lord now yeah. on a daily basis. Um, and through that relationship, I have built relationships with men of God who have mentored me. A lot of these men are sitting in this room tonight. Um, but I know that it's not them, it's God using them because this is all a part of what he wants done. God does have a plan for everybody, like Roscoe said. Um, I never dreamt I would have been living in Georgia. I'm Kentucky born and raised uh, there my whole life, but I've been here for the last three years, and I know this is where God wants me. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of this program with Brother Nick and, and Brother Jimmy and Roscoe and everybody that comes through these doors. It's a blessing and it's a praise to me that on Friday night, there's a program to where if you're struggling with drugs or alcohol or anger or any stronghold that you have in your life, that there's a place that you can go on Friday night to help you deal with your strongholds. And that's my praise. I, I praise the Lord that this program is here and it's working and it's doing what it does. Yes, sir. Thank you, David. All right. The next one we have is Barry Davis. Um, as, as David mentioned, there's a lot of people, this program's here for people. Um, but what one thing we have to cover all the time uh, is how many people come to RU that have none of the problems that we're really listing out as far as a self-help program or, or an addiction ministry right. may be considered. These I'm talking about people who, like his wife, when he, she went home, she said there's just something about it and all that. Barry Davis is an example of one of those people that, that he didn't come because necessarily he needed RU. I'm pretty sure that he's realized like everybody else that didn't need RU that started coming to be a supporter or started coming with somebody or something. Um, I'm sure he's realized and he's seen things and he's gotten help out of RU himself. But he started coming to RU because I believe that he saw some people and he saw the work of RU. He realized the fruitfulness. He realized the mission of it. And he realized the effectiveness of it. And I think that that compels people when they see that when, because we miss it so much in the world. So this is Barry Davis. He has been coming and supportive of RU for maybe four years now. Or is it six years? Time goes by so fast. And he's been driving the van or bus or whatever. We can give him a steering wheel with wheels on it and picking up people and getting them here every Friday night, which is um, one of those unsung, big, mega things for any ministry is to be able to get folks here that couldn't be here and I'm so thankful for Mr. Barry he's always been a blessing and just like so many other people I could you know say welcome come on up here uh, just such a blessing so come on Mr. Barry and share with us 
Good evening. Actually, I was teaching felony drug court classes for Pathways, and I had a couple of students who kept talking about our youth. So I went over to Oakside one Friday and visited and saw the program. Uh, probably about a month later, I went back, and Jimmy Pruitt said he needed help. And he needs somebody to drive the bus. And so God was working on me, and he's like, man, you can do that. Yeah, I can drive a bus. And so I went up to him after everything, and I said, I can drive the bus. He goes, here's the key. <laughs> Just like that. <clears throat> and ever since then, I've been driving the bus. And at first they were calling him, and he'd text me their address and all that. And when we were at Oakside, sometimes you'd have to drive it twice. You'd pick up, bring them over to the church, and then go pick up some more and bring them back to church. And you'd have to take them home the same way. And we had like 20 people on that Oakside bus at one time. Wasn't supposed to have that many. And I was just praying that, you know, please don't get stopped. Because we had children everywhere sitting on laps and everything. But that was the growth that I saw, right? What I like about this, it is a family. Roscoe says it's a home. It is. We're all part of something that we know that makes people better. That's right. And that's God. That's right. You know, and just to let people know that, you know, this is a bad time. Right? Our youth's been through it before. We lost our home one Friday night at Oaksa. What we did the next Friday night, we met at Jimmy's front yard. No, they had a band from Alabama picking up people and drove it. Brother Tony supplied. We did that for a while. And we still had that band when we moved over to New Airport Road in a hot building during the summer and a cold building during the winter, but we got by. And it was an unhappy. Right. I don't remember an unhappy time. Right. We might sweat a little, might shake a little when it's cold, but we had food. We had fellowship. We had the word. Right. Yes. People in groups sharing. We had everything. The children in one part of the building getting their lesson. You know. And then, guess what? Along comes grace. Amen. Guess what? Y'all are welcome at grace. And here we are, right? Praise the Lord. Got two bands that they let us use if we need them. You know, we're going to get through this. And we're going to be stronger for it. We're, we're soon going to be back together. What you need to do every day to get through this is to be thankful. Yes. You have things to be thankful for. You woke up. Some people did. You had a roof over your head. You had food in your belly. That's right. You have this. You have our you that we have the technology that you can still come and share with us. The only thing we can't do now is gather as a group. Doesn't mean we're not a group. That's right. It just means we can't gather as a group. Soon, I'll be driving the bus, picking up people. We won't worry about close contact. Having six feet apart. We won't be doing that. We'll be back and doing what God wants us to do. Reaching people who need Him and sharing love on I watch people come in here and can see change. It to me is what's exciting. They change in front of your eyes. Yeah. Roscoe did. Yeah. Nick, I had him drug court. He did. It wasn't me. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good teacher, but it wasn't me that changed Nick. It was God that changed Nick. That's right. I watched you and McKenzie grow from the first time to the Last. Watch your girls grow. Your girls come here happy. This is what they do on Friday night. Right. This is what we do. This is what Brother Jimmy does on Friday night. Roscoe says it's home. This is where we come. That's right. You know, I, I much rather come here on Friday nights than I had anything. Yeah. When I took a job out of Great Wolf and everything, I told him, I said, on Friday nights, I go to RU, can't work on Friday nights. And first I told him, I said, look, I swim in the mornings, 
and I bowl on Monday morning, so I don't work first shift. And if you put me on third shift, I'm gonna be asleep. So that's for second shift only. <laughs> you get that kind of privilege when you get old, I reckon. But got the job that day, right after the interview. He said, you're hired. But that's just because God blessed me. And then, take it easy. This is going to pass. We have so many people with so much news out there, fighting about everything, opening, not opening, whatever, has nothing to do with us. We're going to open when God's ready for us to reopen. All right. And we'll be back together. And we won't have to worry about people getting sick. But nobody wants anybody to get sick. Nobody does that. I don't want to cause anybody to be sick. I got a little three-year-old grandson that I FaceTime every night. And he's going, when are you going to get over being sick? Well, I'm not sick. But he can't understand that, right? right. He knows he can't come and see us because we're sick. That's what, it, it fits his three-year-old mind. But soon that will be over too. So, you know, praise God for this program. Yeah. I love it. I love Jimmy. I love Robbie and the people in it. You know, I, you can't come and not get, feel good about this. Yes, sir. I get out in that van and drive and pick up people. They're happy to see that van. They know they're going to a good place. First thing some of them say is, what's for dinner? I'm like, well, I don't know. Food, I reckon. Right? But you do get a good meal, too. That's just part of the program. And I think Jamie would tell you, this program has more of everything than any program in the country. We have a bus ministry. We have a teen ministry. We have a children's ministry. Right? We have it all. In a little bitty place like LaGrange, Georgia. Just because this man here held it together when something bad happened. And we all stuck by him. Roscoe wouldn't be here otherwise. Would you? Yes, sir. But, you know, I got mosquito bit in Jimmy's yard, but we got by too. It, it's just we got by. They still had a meal. We still drove a van. We picked up people who needed picked up. We got everybody there that need to go. And we did that, how long? Six months over in the, over on, probably Air Force Road was at least six months. Because it was summer and winter. So, take it, be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for the technology. Be thankful that they're willing to come here and share with you every Friday night. Be thankful for Nick, that his growth has, I don't know, Nick is like, Nick was like, he grew up in front of my eyes. He's like this when he was in drug court. And now, now he's a man. And I watch him with his children. And how good he is a, a dad is. None of that was possible without God. It's just not possible. So be thankful for what you have. We're going to be back. You know, everybody acts like the world's ending. That's not what's happening. We're going to get there. And, but when we do, we're going to be stronger. Love y'all. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Appreciate that. Uh, Barry's one of our, I, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, our Friday night support team. And he's always here doing what he's to do, which is drive that van, pick folks up. We have other folks that do the cooking for us. Lynn and Larissa come, take care of our children, Miss Mallory, or Cherry, uh, Robbie McKenzie doing kids' club. So every Friday night, and I, and I say this uh, because there's a lot of people I know that have begun to watch us and watch our Friday night uh, broadcast that are not regular RU students, and they're tuning in because they're curious. And so I try to give a little bit of information along the way every now and then let you know what we do. Our normal Friday night process runs about two hours. And uh, we have the first talk, which you've talked about. We've talked about our talk, talk, talk procedure. And uh, so we have that first talk, which is when we talk to God through praise and testimony. And that's what uh, Nick just did. Uh, as he led these three guys in a, this praise time. 
uh, them praising God for what he's done in their life through our youth. And uh, that's our first talk. And uh, Nick covered that first principle, which is always part of the first talk as well. Psalm 1, which is always part of the first talk as well. Then the second talk time is when the, the guys and gals will go off into the rooms in the small groups themselves. Uh, women, women together and men together. Those groups, uh, six or eight to most, and they have that time where they interact. Uh, they share what God's done in their life through the week. They uh, relate the principles and the, the scriptures and the fruits of the Spirit to the daily living that they have and how God helps them through that. So uh, they have that, t that small group council time, challenge time, which is where they do uh, uh, challenges, which are part of the curriculum study. Uh, the curriculum of our you leads you through a process of Bible study where uh, you learn verses and you learn uh, about uh, things about God and uh, walking daily in your life as a Christian. And those challenges, and we call those challenges, they're signed off. And you get awards for that. And it's a, it's a big process. And it's part of that disciple, that workbook, those challenges. And that takes place in the second talk where they share those and get those checked off. And then we come back for the third talk, which is a part of the talk where we are, a program where we are now. And uh, we bring a message or a lesson, uh, the Nevertheless I Live textbook. And, of course, we use a student resource guide that all the students use uh, that has a, each week's lesson in it. And uh, they can go along and, uh, and they can make notes and they can fill in the blanks as we give them the answers. So uh, those are the three parts. And that normally takes us up from about 7 o'clock when we start all the way up to about 9 or 9, 10 when we get through that third talk. And then after that, we have a meal together. We have uh, different people that come in and do of their own choice and they're out of their own pockets many times and provide a meal. And uh, we're talking about feeding 60, 70 folks on Friday night. And we do that afterwards. We have that meal and that fellowship time. And uh, that's, that's kind of the way our Friday nights go. And uh, if you're wondering about RU and you're uh, thinking about sending somebody here or coming to visit, we love to have visitors. Uh, we love people just come and participate just to see what it's like. You'll find yourself at home. You get that homey feeling real quick. And uh, you're, you're made welcome. You're made to feel at home. But you'll also get a touch of the Holy Spirit uh, because he's here. He's here on Friday nights. And uh, he's always here with us. And uh, when we come in on Friday nights and we have visitors, people just come out of curiosity. So if you're curious about RU, you come on. Uh, when we open back up, and we're hoping that's going to be maybe sometime in May, uh, the middle of May, hopefully when uh, we'll, we'll start out again on uh, meeting, you come on down and be with us. In the meantime, you join us on Friday nights, and uh, you recommend it to us. And I, I, I appreciate your patience with us. Uh, we had some technical difficulties getting started there. And... and uh, and that's partially my fault. I'm, I'm slow to learn this. And most of you, know, those of you that know me, uh, know I'm learning this Facebook thing and it's going live real slow. And, uh, but I, this is also posted on an RU Directors website or a Facebook page, too, that only RU Directors are part of that group. And so when I, I put that out there and, and, and went out on that website, on that uh, Facebook page, I had one of my RU friends, a uh, director from up in Michigan, that sent me a text. He said, don't worry about it, Brother Jimmy. He said, we went for 45 minutes thinking we were live. We were doing that wholehearted, full strength, and we never even, we didn't darken anybody's door, light up anybody's screen. So you don't worry about it. God will get the message out there. We're thankful. Thankful to be able to work through this technology. Thankful for Aaron coming and doing it for us on Fridays and helping with that. And uh, uh, that's just, uh, we're thankful. We praise God for what he's doing. We praise him for RU. Uh, we praise him for the, uh, the, the fellowship, the friendship that we have. We praise him for the discipleship that we have. And so tonight we're going to move on into our third talk tonight, our lesson tonight, principle number three. Now, uh, Nick gave a principle. He gave principle number two. He's the principle behind uh, and giving those principles for the first talk. And that's part of what we're doing in our third talk, too, is teaching principles. And we just, it kind of coincidentally fell out that way here right at this time. But third talk lesson tonight, principle number three, it's easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it's been defiled. And we list our principles. We got 10. Now, if you remember, I told you before, these are not 10 steps. These are 10 principles for living, for wise living. We need wisdom in this world that we live in today to live as godly men and women. If you just trust Christ as your Savior, if you're a brand new Christian, you need all the instruction you can get. We need all the instruction to get senior saints. Those who have been doing this for a long time, we need wisdom for living our lives every day in this wicked world that we live in. And it's not going to get any better. God's words has promised us that. 
The only thing we're going to do is get closer to time when he comes back to get us, and we praise him for that. But ten principles for living, not ten steps, uh, not you finish one, you get another one, and you pick and choose. God will put all of these principles into play in your life, sometimes all at one time. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about principle number three. Now, uh, the founder of Reform is unanimous, Stephen Currington. Uh, this, the principle that, number three, the illustration that he used for that is one that we're very familiar with. And I remember Brother Steve personally the first time he ever gave that testimony or, or used the illustration about principle number three. And he called it chili and fries surprise. And it simply was uh, just to give you a synopsis of it. Uh, he, as a bachelor, had been used to making a meal that he always liked. And it was french fries with chili on top of them. Now, we get chili cheese fries. We didn't use any cheese. It was just chili and fries. But, and so we recognized that. We know what he's talking about. But he would, uh, right after he got married, he went into the kitchen there one night when his wife was going to be gone, wasn't going to cook for him. And he got the fry daddy out, and he got the french fries out, and he got the chili out, and he fried them up, and he got the chili hot on the stove and poured it over those fries. And he had chili and fries surprise, which is something men might eat. I could probably eat two or three times a week if I had to. And he loved that meal. And that was one of his favorite meals. And so that Monday night when his wife had gone away, he went in the kitchen in there and cooked that meal for himself. And boy, he was fit for king. But his wife didn't like it because it made such a mess. Now, if you've ever done any kind of frying at all, French fries or fish or anything, it can splatter grease everywhere and chili when it gets dry. It's hard to clean up. He left that mess. He didn't clean it up. Guess what? Neither did she. He needed to learn a lesson. The next time that happened, which was the next Monday night or the next Tuesday night, he goes in the kitchen and gets ready to make his chili and fry surprise, and guess what? She had left all of that stuff there, left the fry daddy sitting out there, left the pot with the crusted over cheese in it and splattered all over the countertop. He had to clean it all up before he could eat, before he could make chili and fry surprise. Now, you know as well as I do, when something is cooked like that and the grease gets hard and cold, it's hard to clean up. When chili dries up and it gets crusted over on the pot or on the stove or on the counter, it's hard to clean up. you got to scrub it. And so he learned a valuable lesson. If he was going to eat that meal, when he got through with it, he needed to clean up that mess before he could enjoy that meal again, before he could move to that stage again of having chili and fry surprise. And that's one of the illustrations that he used. It's easier to keep that kitchen cleaned up and to keep that kitchen stove cleaned up than it was to clean it up when he needed to use it so it doesn't got a mess and he had to go clean it up. And that's kind of what he's talking about when we think about that and that simple little illustration there. It's easier to keep our hearts clean than it is to clean it up after it's been defiled, after it's been dirtied up. And by the way, it'll get dirtied up. It'll get nasty. Uh, God tells us in his word in the book of John that if we are friends with the world, we're enmity with him. That means if we love the things of the world, which are not always righteous things, which are not always morally correct things, uh, most of the time they're self-centered things or they're uh, things of, of the world, then God says you're an enmity to me. If we love those things, if we love those things that dirty up our heart, then we're an enmity with God. When the, the things of the world clog up the pipeline, so to speak, we can't have that clean communication with God. We have to keep our heart clean. We have to keep that open communication, that open channel. You see, talking to God's a two-way conversation. Now, that means not us talking all the time. That means sometimes we have to just pause, stop just a minute and let him talk to us. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of talking to somebody. When I talk to some of these guys here, when I talk to my wife, sometimes I'm just blah, 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 just as fast as I can talk like a machine gun, and I never slow down and let that other person say a word. And that can be very frustrating. I've learned that. I've learned that the hard way. Uh, by people explaining that to me. And so when we're talking to God, when we're in that communication with God, when our heart wants to speak to God, sometimes we got to get it cleaned up and then we got to talk, but we got to listen and let God speak to us. So it's easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it's been defiled. Now, we're going to use in this lesson tonight, uses the example of Lot. We remember from even our basic Sunday school or vacation Bible school, if a, uh, a brand new first time Christian uh, coming into RU or a brand new Christian and just getting saved, most of the time when we talk to them about Lot and Abraham, they recognize that and they realize uh, uh, who that was. Uh, 
those Old Testament saints. And so using the example of Lot, if we look over in Genesis, we're going to look in the book of Genesis and the book of 2 Peter. Looking over in Genesis chapter number 13, we find out where Lot is mentioned, and we kind of know the background. Abraham and Lot were traveling together, and they had lots of herds. They were very successful herdsmen. They were uh, raising flocks and cattle and sheep, and uh, they needed to feed them, and they were moving about in the plains of of uh, the land of Canaan and they found out that there wasn't enough uh, grazing or they needed some more grazing or some more pasture land if you would for all those cattle and sheep and so Abraham and Lot they decided that they would split up and uh, Abraham said unto Lot he said in verse number 8 of chapter number 13 and Abraham said unto Lot let there be no strife I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen for we be brethren is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right, then I will go to the left. In other words, Abraham said, look, we need to part ways. We need to split up so that our herdsmen are not uh, contention with each other for the same grazing. And Abraham and Lot. And so Lot did. And uh, verse number 10 says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest and so are. Lot looked out there and he seen, you ever heard that expression, the grass is greener on the other side? Lot looked out across the plains of Jordan towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw that that land was beautiful. In fact, he said it even makes the comparison as it was with the garden of Eden that God had in the beginning, and it was well watered, there was plenty of water, there was plenty of food, plenty of grazing for the sheep and the cattle, and Lot said, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they departed and separated themselves, the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and verse number 12, very important phrase, and pitched his tent Toward Sodom. Now we remember our Bible stories about the land of Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened to that land. Verse number 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So let's think about what's happened here for just a moment. Let's try to make up some parallels. Here's Abraham and Lot that need to separate ways and go their own ways, and Lot gives him the choice. Lot, Abraham gives Lot the choice. He says, Lot, you choose whatever you want to choose, and I'll take what's left, or I'll go the other way. And Lot looked out there, and he saw the grass being greener on the other side, so to speak. He saw all of that beauty and all of that, and he seen Sodom out there, and he said, I'll take this over here, and that's what, Lot, that's what Abraham gave him. And the Bible says that he went that way, and he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now that don't mean that he went out in the suburb. You know, we're out in a, in a rural area in our county and we have subdivisions. He didn't go to the suburbs. He wasn't out in a subdivision. He got right down there real close and he pitched his tent. The opening of his door of his tent was set towards the city of Sodom. What does that mean? That means he was looking that way continually. Uh, the custom was, much as the custom is now. I mean, in the late in the evening, a lot of times I'll go out on my back porch, or Robbie and I will, we'll go out on the porch and drink a cup of coffee and just sit and look and just enjoy that peace and that quiet time. That's kind of what happened with Lot. He pitched his tent, and in the evening, the cool of the evening, he would sit outside the door of his tent, and guess what he saw? Guess what he was looking at? Guess what he was close to? The city of Sodom. The Bible says the city of Sodom was full of wicked and sinners before the Lord. So let's draw just a little bit of a parallel there. As us as born-again believers or maybe the one who's never trusted Christ, God's given choices. God gives you a choice. You can choose God in all of his glory and all of his beauty and all of his splendor and all of his blessing and all his provision for you, or you can choose to look towards the worldly things. And sometimes that's what happens to us. Lot was a righteous man. Now, that word righteous stirs up a lot of times uh, things in our heart. In fact, over in the book of 2 Peter, he was called a just man. Uh, that word righteous means that he walked upright before God. Now, we know that Abraham and Lot lived in the time before Jesus Christ died on the cross, before the Messiah came. 
And so those people, Abraham and Lot and those uh, uh, people in those Old Testament saints, they, were, they lived their lives trusting fully in God, looking forward to the Savior, and they lived a righteous life. Uh, if they trusted God, just as you and I trust God today, we want to live our life in a manner that pleases God. We want to walk every day in a manner that pleases God and brings honor to God and glory to God. And so did they. Abraham did and Lot did. They lived their lives in a manner that they could be called just and righteous. They were justified just as you and I are by what Christ did on the cross. And even though they looked forward to it and we look back to it, it's still the same justification. So Lot was a righteous and a just man, but yet he made a choice to pitch his tent towards Sodom. He associated with ungodly men. Now this is a big trick for us here. This is one of Satan's biggest plans, one of his easiest to fulfill plans. Uh, we have people come into Reformers Unanimous that have some stronghold in their life, whether it be an addictive behavior or whether it be just a stubborn stronghold where, uh, that Satan has gotten in someone's life. And they trust Christ as their Savior and they begin to gain some strength and begin to grow. And many times, many times, they begin to slip and they begin to fall when they try to go back and hang out with those old friends again. In fact, one of our principles, principle number six, says those who do not love the Lord and not hate to serve the Lord, what we find out is in our own lives, you know, if we, if we hang around with the wrong people, what would, what would Mama say? If you sleep with the dogs, you get fleas. If we're going to keep hanging around with those, if we're going to keep rubbing up against the world, guess what? The world's going to rub off on us. He associated, Lot associated. And if you do a little bit more study about Lot, you find out that he just, not only did he pitch his tent in that direction where he was looking at the city of Sodom, he also began to venture into the city and he began to partake of the pleasures of the city. And in fact, he had found a, uh, a place the time came when he was one of the leaders in the city. He sat at the city gate. What happened? He moved away from that one who had great godly influence on him from Uncle Abraham. He moved away from those that had that godly and he moved off by himself and began to look towards the world and began to associate with ungodly men. He had day-to-day -day contact with sin. Now you and I know that the blood of Christ has saved us from the power of sin in our life. Sin has no power. Resurrection power is what we have and we, because of 1 John 1 9, we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know that. We recognize that. God, Christ's blood has cleansed us and saved us from the power, but it did not remove us from the presence of sin. Right. Now, we would all like to think that we could keep ourselves cloistered and, you know, this, uh, uh, this kind of a shutdown we got, uh, this shelter at home. Uh, maybe sometimes we think we could shelter at home and, and we would be uh, safe or free from the presence of sin. Well, we can as long as we stay at home, but sometimes you got to go to Walmart. Sometimes you got to go get some gas. Eventually, you got to get a haircut and get your nails done. Eventually, you don't have to take your car to the repair shop. And, be, and what happens when that takes place? We're out there in the world. We're in the presence of sin. Now, sometimes Reformers Unanimous students, new students, struggle with that concept of turning away from those worldly friends. He had day-to-day -day contact with sin. The people around him caused him to fall into moral wickedness. Now, here's just lot, righteous lot, wanting to walk uprightly before God, but coming in contact with that sin and choosing to do so. And the Bible says that he began to get a downhill slide. In fact, we know the story of Lot. We know that when God comes to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the excessive wickedness there, and the book of Genesis will tell us all about that in chapter 13, and to destroy that city. And he told Lot, he said, I'll save Lot out of that city because he knew that Lot was a righteous and a just man, and he knew that Lot had become too close and too associated with the sin that was there. And he said, I'm going to save Lot, and I'm going to get him and his family out of there kind of reminds me of just Noah saving Noah and his family. He said, I'm going to get a lot of him. You know the story, one of those that we know from Bible school and children's church, uh, uh, when they began to leave that city as it was burning and falling, 
And uh, he said, Lot, you leave, you take your family, you get out of there and go and don't look back. But you remember Lot's wife, she turned and looked back, turned into a pillar of salt. God saved Lot from that destruction. But what happened to Lot? Because of this constant association with sin. Now listen to me. This is important for you and I to remember as born-again believers, as Christians living in a sinful world, as walking every day in the presence of sin, free from the power of sin in our life through the resurrection power, but in the presence of sin. Remember what happened to Lot, a righteous man. He made worldly choices to associate with evil men. He narrowly escaped destruction. He lost his wife, his property, and his reputation all in one time. Now, it can happen. All because we make that choice. We let the sin defile our heart. You see, Lot made a choice to pitch his tent and go towards Sodom. And the more that he came into contact with that worldly, sinful influence, the more his heart became defiled. Now, we like to talk about in Reformers Unanimous and what we try to teach and try to teach each other and our students is keeping our heart clean. How do we do that? And I always use the analogy a lot of times or, or the illustration a lot of times. You know, this coronavirus thing is going on. We've got us all fully aware of disinfecting and sanitizing and hand washing and all of those things. And all of those things will become the new normal. We didn't used to do it that much, but we're going to do it that way. And uh, even I was noticing, talking to my wife, you know, the, the hand sanitizers and the Clorox wipes, boy, they, they rough on your hands. They dry your skin out, and, and they're harsh. Uh, they have harsh chemicals. I mean, the Clorox, chlorine bleach is a harsh chemical. And some of the methods of cleaning, what about in our hearts? What about our hearts when they get defiled? How do we clean them up? Well, we like to say we use the wet wipe of the word. Uh, you know what a wet wipe is, if you've ever had children, been around children, and I like to think about, you know, those baby wipes, you know, not the Clorox wipes, the baby wipes, you know, they're soft, they have aloe in them, they have all sorts of emollients in them, things that make the skin soft, and you use it on, on Junior's behind and clean him up and keep him clean with it, and it don't affect his skin, it's not a harsh chemical, it's soft, it's soothing, it's pleasing, it's cleansing. And then on the other hand, you got that Clorox wipe, or maybe even like Brother Steve Curtin had stuck on that stove that day, he had to get a Brillo pad out. Now, you know what a Brillo pad is? That's steel wool with some soap in it. And it's harsh. It's hard. It'll cut. In fact, you can't use it on everything because it'll take the finish off. So don't you think it would be better to keep our hearts clean by using the wet wipe of the Word? That means taking God's Word daily, Going to the scriptures daily. Proverbs is a good place to start. The chapters in Proverbs. Going every day and using the word to clean up what's gotten dirty or waiting on God to come with a Brillo pad and clean it up. You see, it's easier to keep it clean every day than it is to clean it up after it's been defiled and you got to do that scraping and that scrubbing. Proverbs 22 says, A prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 6 says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? We can't expect to become an association and become friends with sin and it not have an effect on us. Proverbs 4 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. One of the foundational passages of Scripture we use in forms, and Nick and the guys have already quoted tonight, Psalm 1, the first verse of Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Right there in that first verse, he tells us, he tells us we're not to walk, we're not to stand, and we're not to sit. You see, what happens is kind of a progression. Uh, think back maybe when you started into high school, and that was over 40 years for me when being in high school, but you remember you had friends and you, you walked up and down the hall back when we changed classes and going in, we had lockers and everybody stopped and do their chit-chatting in the hall, and we walked up and down the halls, and we didn't really get into a lot of trouble making our way to classes, and, but then sometimes we would find those friends that we would 
want to spend a little more time with them, maybe we would stand with them at their locker and stand and talk with them. We'd become more friends with them, become a little deeper engaged. And then sometimes we would even move with them and we'd have a class together and we'd move off down the hallway from our locker to sit down in that class. And you see, that's kind of the thing that he's talking about, uh, God's talking about when he shares with us in Psalm 1. Uh, who we walk with, who we stand with, and who we sit with. And it'll have an effect on us. You see, if you hang out with scornful people, pretty soon you're going to be a scorner yourself. If you always, and we've all got those people in our lives, we know they're always negative. No matter what happens, they've got something critical to say. The Bible tells us as born-again believers that whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is pure, yeah. whatsoever is a good report, yeah. if it has virtue for us to think on these things, but not those critical negative people. They want to find what's wrong with everything. Right. And not only do they want to be negative and sad sack, they want to bring us down with them. It's the same thing with being guilty by association. You ever been accused of doing something or being somewhere because you were seen there doing something that you didn't participate in, but you were there. You're guilty by association. That happens. So you see, when we think about keeping our heart clean, it's easier for us to clean it up every day. By the way, we do that by maintaining that open communication with God. We always remember if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, he'll forgive us. We keep that pathway open so we can talk to God, we can listen to it. It's easier for us to do that on a daily basis than it is like chili and fry suppliers letting it get all crusted and baked on and hard and have to come in there and scrape and cut and dig to get it off. I don't know about you, but my heart can get tender sometimes. I don't want to have to come in there and be scraping on it and scrubbing on it with a real old pad. I'd much rather take the wet wipe of the Word. I'd much rather take God's Word and open it up every day and let Him point out to me where I'm going wrong and what kind of condition my heart's in so I can correct it right then and get it straight before I go on through the day. By the way, for me, that needs to take place early in the morning. I don't know about you, but i got to get my feet going in the right direction. i got to get my Psalm 1 walk headed in the right direction first thing in the daytime instead of trying to wait and catch it up and clean it up later on in the evening. It can be hard to do. So it's easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it's been defiled. And I'll give you one verse in the Psalm to close out with and finish up. Psalm number 34, Psalm chapter 34, verse number 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Let's not be like Lot. Let's don't turn our hearts and focus ourselves and our lives on the wickedness of the world. Let's cry out to the Lord. He knows where we are. He knows exactly where we are. And all we got to do is say, Lord, Father, Abba, Daddy, what can I do to get back straight? What's in, the, what's in my life that's defiling my heart? Help me get it cleaned up. You remember David said that, uh, search me, O oh God. He said, search my heart. Find out those wicked things that are in there and purge them. He said he didn't want to lose the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. So let's don't be like Lot. Let's don't pitch our tent toward the worldly, wicked things and associate with sinful things and sinful people. We've got to learn to clean up our hearts on a daily basis before it gets defiled. It would be easier to keep it that way. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and we do thank you for those who tune in tonight. Thank you for this word, God, to have it reminds us to be careful, to be vigilant. You teach us in your words that Satan, is he's like a roaring lion. Lord, seeking whom he can devour and destroy. And Lord, your word teaches us to be vigilant, to stay away from those sinful things, to turn against the wickedness of the world, not be friends with the world, but to be friends with God. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for this lesson tonight. Thank you for Steve Carrington and that, that homespun uh, illustration that he gives us of the chili and the fry surprise. And Lord, it's so true and so basic. It just sticks right in there and helps us every day. We love you. We thank you for giving us this medium to get this message out tonight. And Lord, I pray you touch the heart of someone that's listening. Lord, maybe there's a Christian out there that's walked too long on the wild side, walked too long on the worldly side, too close to the sin. And Lord, they want to get back. Lord, I pray you strike their heart tonight with that conviction of 1 John 1 9. Help them see if they'll confess it and you'll forgive it. Lord, we thank you for those who are tuning in tonight uh, who miss being here on Friday night. We ask you to encourage them. Encourage their hearts tonight, Lord. Let them know that we will one day be back. It'll be a new normal, a different normal. But we'll be back to meeting on Friday night because we trust you and we have that confidence in you. Thank you for giving us this time and these men here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.